Um, for the rest of this year and then into the first of next year, uh, we're going to go a little bit different direction. I don't know if we'll come back to Moses or not, um, but uh, today we're going to really kind of come to the end of this part of talking about the life of Moses, um, and, uh, and, and this whole series has been called Living a Life of Purpose, right? And, and today, the title of the message is, I can't wait, I can't wait. Except for, it, it's not good, okay? I just, just want to throw, you out there, throw that out there to you. The, this I can't wait is not a good I can't wait. Mm. It's not. How many of us in here love to wait on things? Uh, that, I mean, you hear the term, good things come to those who wait. Uh, but nobody wants to wait for the good things, right? They just, what, when do you want it? Now, <laughs> and, and we want it, we want it right now, we want it prepared, and, and we want it, uh, and, and even if we have to wait on something, as soon as we get it, we devour it just like that, right? Uh, how many of y'all just had Thanksgiving dinner and spent more than three hours making the Thanksgiving dinner? Uh, spent more than a, three days making Thanksgiving dinner, and it was over in 45 minutes, right? Boom, right? Uh, but, uh, so... Christmas approaches every year, and, and here for me with my kids, as Christmas would approach every year, I don't know how things would go, but my kids, and especially my son, would always try to find a way to be able to open a present early. Come on, Dad. Come on. Just one. Just one. And, and, I, and honestly, um, they have already got one, haven't you guys? <laughs> He's like, yes, we did. Um, so <laughs> they want to be able to open, trying to convince me <clears throat> to convince mom, because in our house, I may be the head of the house, but my wife is the neck that turns the head, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so nobody's opening anything until mom says it's okay. So maybe we can do it Christmas Eve instead of Christmas morning. And it worked one time, and then that was it. Mom was mad. We weren't ever doing that again. Um, <clears throat> But, but we're always, and we're trying to guess, what is it, right? And, and I'm one of those that's, I'm, I'm like the king of guessing, right? I, I can pick up a, a bag and just kind of shake it and squeeze it and be like, I know exactly what this is. Um, it doesn't work every time, but, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm more often than not can guess what a present is. My wife got me a birthday present one year, just a couple years ago, and she handed me the box and I told her I knew exactly what it was. And she says, there's no way... You could possibly know what it is. She said, I just found it as I was looking through on the internet, and I saw this thing, and I knew that you would really love it. And I'm looking at the box, and I said, I know what's in this box. And she's like, you can't. She goes, tell me what it is. And I said, no, because if I'm wrong, then, you know, you'll be like, ha, ha, ha. And I said, and so we go about this for a few minutes, and I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type it out on my phone, what I think it is, and I'm going to turn my phone upside down and set it over here. I said, and then when I open it, you can take a look at what my phone says to know that I knew what it was. And so I opened it up, and I don't know if you all know, but I'm a Star Trek fan, a Trekkie, a little bit of a nerd when it comes to that. You go into my office. It's a Star Trek communicator that is a Bluetooth that hooks to my phone, and you can tap it, and it goes chirp, 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 and, and you can talk to it and, and use it in the whole nine yards. And, and, it, and I knew that's what it was, and she was blown away. I had it on my phone, and I showed her, and she was like, you saw it when it came in. You knew what it was. No, I just had guessed. I actually had asked her for it at one point in time, and she forgot that I asked her for it, but... Uh, but but I, I love to try to guess. We're always trying to guess what we're going to get. We, we just we can't wait for what's coming. Can we? The thing is, is some of that stuff, it's fun. But if you think about it, and I've, I've mentioned this so many times before, but we really do live in what, what I call a fast food society. Right? A fast food society. Um, we want everything right now. You know, if you got to wait more than five minutes for your food at McDonald's, you're calling the manager. What's wrong with these people? I thought this was fast food, you know. Uh, 
I, I, I just, we, we want everything from our hamburgers to our cars to our homes. We don't want just our cars to be fast. We want them now. We don't want to have to wait to get what we want. We want it now. I want a new car and I want it now. So I go out and I get a loan that is more than I can afford so I can have the car that I want now. I go and I find a house and I really want this four bedroom, three bathroom house with a pool and a, a garage and all that. And, 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 and I'm 19 years old and my credit score says I can get one. So I go and I get one and I get an enormous loan and I can't really afford it. But that's what I want and I want it right now. I don't want to have to wait. I don't want to have to go through the process to get to what I actually should be able to get. It doesn't just stop with presents and finances. It can carry into jobs, our ministries, and our morals. We will compromise to get what we want when we want it. In jobs, we, we, we want the pay and position of a seasoned employee. In ministry, we want to do the same because, you know, these old folks just don't know what's best for the church today. Have you ever heard of that one? Oh, if I could do it the way I want to do it, and I could do it right now, I'd show those people how it should be done. You know, I, I remember as a, a young man feeling the call into ministry, I couldn't wait to preach a sermon. I was ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and I'd heard my pastor preach and I'd heard other people preach and I was ready to get up and preach a message and I knew that when I preached, I was going to preach it just right and everyone in the room was going to get saved. But no one came to the altar. It was really terrible. Um, <laughs> it was hard. But I want it and I want it now. I want it the way that I one. And then, then we go into our morals. Our morals. And this is a bad one, probably the worst one. You see, they say that everyone has a price that will cause them to compromise their morality. And for most, the price really isn't that high at all. The number one industry in the world today, and for thousands of years, has been sexual immorality. While many used to wait for marriage today, even in the church, most just can't wait. They need their desires to be met now, and they don't care about the outcome. Our problem comes down to those three little words. I can't wait. I can't wait. As we've looked at the life of Moses through the series of sermons called Living a Life of Purpose, we've actually come here to one of the craziest stories in the Bible. It's, it's just absolutely nuts to me when I read this story. I look at these people. The Hebrews are an impatient people full of nothing but complaints. No matter how much God provides for them, all they can do is complain about what they don't have or what they don't have right now. God continually gives them promise after promise. He always puts the tagline, if you're faithful, I will give you this. If you're faithful, I will provide you this. But it always comes with a little bit of waiting. But these guys, they couldn't wait for a cheeseburger in line at McDonald's. They want it now. They really, really, they don't want it now. They want it yesterday. Oh. They've not only seen all the miracles of God as he delivered them from Egypt, parted the sea, provided food from heaven and water from a rock. They've actually seen as God descended from heaven and lightning and thunder and fire as he descended onto the mountain and he spoke to them from the cloud in the mountain and they heard 
the audible voice of God speaking to them. But now they get to a place where they do something that's really dumb. Well, not that they haven't already been doing a bunch of dumb stuff. Now they've got to get to a place where they do something just absolutely nuts. And when we look at this story, you might be like, well, that's crazy. We would never do anything like that. But the truth is, we do it all the time. So, as we discussed last week, after all of these things that they've seen and heard and been a part of, they reject hearing directly from God any longer. They say, Moses, we don't want to hear God speak to us because it might kill us. So uh, we want you to go talk to God for us and get us the instructions and then come back and give us what God has for us and we will listen to you. Right? Go and take care of us, Moses. Go do it. So, Moses does it. He goes to meet God on Mount Sinai for all of 40 days. Not a real long time to wait. 40 days. Now, I do know of a a group of 500 people that couldn't wait 10 days. So, this is a group of, you know, maybe a million people or more. So, uh, 40 days may seem like a, a long, long time. And so he goes up and for 40 days, God speaks to Moses and carves out the law on tablets of stone. While Moses is on the mountain, these people go completely bonkers. They come up with something that you just would think after a time, they just, could they really come up with something so dumb? While they're standing at the base, they're camped out at the base of the mountain, they can see the clouds surrounding the mountain. I'm sure they hear thunderings and things going on as God is speaking to Moses. And they're right there in the presence of God. But they just can't wait. So we get to Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him. When they finally got too impatient and couldn't wait any longer, they said, hey Aaron, come over here. We need to have a conversation. Up. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, I just want you to notice here for a second, Aaron does not argue with them. He is the second in command over all of Israel, over all of these Hebrews, he, he was a part. He was the voice for Moses, the voice of God to Egypt. He was the one that, that stood beside Moses the whole time, right there beside him, as all of these events take place. And the people of Israel come to him with one little complaint and their impatience and say, hey, uh, we don't know what's going on. It's been a few days, and we're kind of getting bored down here, so we need you to make us some gods. Just make some stuff up. And Aaron, with everything he's got, he says, Okay, you bet. That's scriptural right there. It's, it says, So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, and they said These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of 
of Egypt. Have you ever heard of anything so dumb? I mean, really. Oh, it's just been so hard. We were completely delivered out of Egypt. We watched the sea split. We watched plagues happen. And, and we, we saw the blood that, that caused death to pass over us. And we got manna from heaven and quail from heaven. God's provided, us every, provided for us every step of the way. And he even spoke to us from heaven. Let's just abandon all that because we don't want to wait any longer for what God has for us. They know who God is. And they have time and time again committed their very lives to God. They have said, we will do what God has commanded. We will do as Moses has commanded. They said it time and time again. These are the people of God. These aren't, these aren't the Egyptians. These aren't the Assyrians. These aren't these other folks. These are the people of God that have been in the presence of God, have heard from God, have been delivered by God. All of these amazing things. And here they are, taking all that, and in a moment, throwing it to the side. Why? Because they can't wait. Things just aren't going the way they want. Their promises just aren't coming fast enough. So they just decide to come up with another way to do things. Aaron gets, them their, gets their gold earrings and makes a golden calf for them to worship. Now, I don't know how big this thing was, but it had to have been pretty huge because there's a lot of earrings going on. Great big golden calf. Oh. Uh. But we'd never do anything like that. So then comes the wrath of God. It seems that God is so angry with the Hebrews that in Exodus chapter 32, verse 9 and 10, he tells Moses that he wants to wipe them out and just start over. God, God knew what he was doing. I don't, I don't think it was just the prayers of Moses that, that changed God's mind. God knew what was going to happen. But... <laughs> Have you ever just been so frustrated with somebody who's just like, I want to give them a high five in the face with a wheelchair? Right? Like, come on. God's like, I'm just... <laughs> he even tells Moses, he's just so frustrated with these people. He, he just wants to wipe them all out and let's just start over with you, Moses. You've been faithful. I mean, you've complained a little bit, but you just, through all the thick and thin, you've been faithful. So let's just start over with you. But Moses does pray, and he's like, God, please don't kill him. God says, okay, all right, all right, I'm not going to do that. He didn't destroy them all. But then Moses comes down from the mountain. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 19 and 20, it says this. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. I think Moses was mad. I just want you to know that Moses was the first person in recorded history to download from the cloud. And he's also the first person in recorded history to break all Ten Commandments at the same time. All right, that's just fun right there. Oh, Moses is so angry, he loses his temper. He crashes the tablets uh, with the law on the ground. Oh, he's mad. Smashes this calf and puts it in the water and makes him drink it. You want the God, here you go. 
have it. Oh, and so then he looks at Aaron. This right here is the epitome of this story. This is, this is it right here. I love it. What happens when we start doing dumb stuff? Well, we just add on to the dumb stuff, don't we? We start lying, and we try to hide, and we, oh, and well, okay, well. Moses looks at Aaron and says, where did this golden calf come from? Verse 23, it says, for they said to me, oh, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any of you have gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. Oops. Well, we just make up all kinds of stuff, right? What a joke. Boop. Out comes the calf. Oh. But won't we make up every kind of excuse for our sin? You know what these people really wanted? You know what this whole thing was? They were tired of waiting. They were tired of trying to be holy. They were try- tired of living according to the way they thought that God wanted them to live. And they just wanted a party. Earlier in Scripture, it says that they wanted to play. To play. They're throwing a party and every kind of immorality that you could imagine was going on in the house of Israel. Right in front of of the mountain of God where God was manifested. Right in the presence of God, these people are sinning. But here's something that happens. Moses had prayed and God did not utterly wipe out all these crazy folks. But God still makes this statement right before He sends a plague on the people. Exodus 32, 33, it says, But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. You see, the Lamb's book of life has been around longer than we have. It's been around since before Jesus walked on the earth as a man. It's been around since the beginning of time. It's God's book. And sin, sinners, those that live in a life style of sin and debauchery before God, God says, those who have sinned against me, I will blot their name out of my book. The ultimate wrath of God is not what we see through Revelation where God is going to send all these plagues and vials and bowls that are poured out on the earth. That's part of the destruction of of people and and that's part of the destruction of the earth. All of those things that are going to happen are the wrath of God. But the ultimate wrath of God against the sinner is that one day, If you have not given your life to God, if you are not a committed Christian living for God, He will blot your name out of His book. In Revelation, He says, To him who overcomes, I will not blot your name out of the Lamb's book of life. So what about us? What about us? Well, in the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus tells us something that is very important, and he tells us three times. Now, I think I've mentioned this before. One of my favorite studies, wasn't my favorite, uh, whenever I was going through ministry school, was hermeneutics. It's a fancy word that means how to study the Bible. It's an even fancier word for the studying English. And I don't know if you've heard me speak very much. 
I don't speak English very well, and I don't really know how to tear sentence structures apart. My kids and my wife make fun of me a lot for it. Um, I, I just say whatever comes out of my mouth <laughs> and hope it comes out right, and sometimes it doesn't. But, uh, but hermeneutics is, is, is how to study the Bible. But if there, if there was one thing I, I learned when I was studying hermeneutics was understanding the importance of things and how many times that they're said in Scripture. You see, when you read the Scripture and it says it once, it's important because it's Scripture. If it says it twice, it's really important. Maybe you should take a second look. It says it twice. If it says it three or more times, um, hey folks, you might really want to hang on these words. You might want to get a deeper understanding of what is being said when it says it repeatedly. That's why whenever Scripture says, and just using the word repent is like 45 times in the New Testament, I think repentance might be important. And when Jesus says what he says in Revelation chapter 22, and he says it three times, maybe, just maybe, we should take a second look. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. He says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12 says, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. And verse 20, he says it a third time. He who testifies to these things says, Surely, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I don't know if you've caught on to what Jesus is trying to say, but he says, I am coming soon. He is coming back soon. Now, his definition and my definition of soon don't seem to be the same because it's been a couple thousand years he hadn't come back yet. But when Jesus says he's coming back, you can take it to the bank that Jesus is coming back. You can know that Jesus is coming back. We know Jesus is coming back. Do we know that? But do we believe it? We, we, we believe it? Did the Israelites believe that Moses was meeting with God on the mountain? They did. Did they live it? No. We say we believe it. But do we live it? You see, just as the Hebrews decided to do things their own way, many in the church are doing the same thing. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 says this, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching, hear, itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. They get tired of waiting. I can't wait. Let me bring together somebody that's going to tell me what I want to hear. I don't care what the word says. I just want you to smile to me and tell me it's all going to be all right. Just as the Hebrews said, make us gods. People today do the same thing. When they listen to and learn from those that don't teach the true word of God, but rather teach that uh, what will make a crowd feel good and bring in more money. They want to fill stadiums and buildings and they want to get themselves on television and have big long programs and good commercials and sell stuff so that you'll buy it and they can have more. And then we mix other things like astrology, voodoo, witchcraft, horoscopes, and more, and say we have 
some kind of walk with God. I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. I find it really interesting. Somebody that will quote scripture with one breath and then tell you their horoscope with the next. As if that positioning of the stars has anything to do with your life. There was only one time when a star really gave direction to anything that was godly. And it was a prophecy of a star that would form over a little town in Bethlehem and wise men followed that star to find Jesus. That's the only time there was a star that gave any real godly direction. You see, one of the worst things is when we just do what we want and we don't care about the outcome. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 21 says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, all, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them Israel stood at the base of the mountain and they saw God descend from heaven on the mountain they heard God speak they knew the power and authority of God but they did not care and today what is Known uh, what can be known about God is plain to us. It is plain to the world because God has shown it to us. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. It goes on to say how God gave them up to their vile affections. We like to read the rest of that and go on about some of the details that are in there, but all of it comes back to the place of ungodliness and unrighteousness before God, knowing who God is and denying the power thereof. Would you stand with me this morning? See, God's wrath is going to be poured out. It is a scary thought. That God is going to wipe out all unrighteousness. It's scary to think that if you don't know Jesus, if you're living in a life of unrighteousness, God is going to wipe you out. But He's not going to just wipe you out like you die from the face of the earth. There's something that the Scripture calls the second death. It is when your name is blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. It is whenever you are removed from the presence of God and eternally not cast into hell. Hell is not the end for the wicked. It is the lake of fire, an eternal place of separation from God. So the question is, is there hope? Is, is there hope? Romans 6.23 One of those quotables for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is hope. There's hope. 
There's hope for you and there's hope for me. There's hope for those that are completely lost and do not know Jesus right now. There is a hope. And there's a hope for those of us that, that have wandered off of the path sometimes. There's still a hope. You see, Moses stood in the gap for the Israelites. When God said, I'm going to wipe them out, Moses prayed, God, don't wipe them out. And God said, I won't. But there's coming a day when I will wipe the sinner's name out of the book of life. But I will provide a way through my son. You see, better than Moses' prayers is the advocate, the one that atoned for our sin, and by his arms being spread across that cross while his blood shed from the cross, while it flowed down his body as his crown of thorns was put on his head, he bridged the gap between us and God and said that I will cover your sins if you'll just believe in me. While the wrath of God will be poured out, we have an escape through the blood of Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other name. There is no other cross. There is no other thing. There is only through the blood of Jesus. And the thing is, Jesus said, I am coming back soon. Moses was only gone for 40 days and the Israelites couldn't wait. We've been hearing our whole lives that Jesus is coming back. For a couple thousand years we've been hearing that Jesus is coming back. And people grow weary and fade away. And we're no better than those in Israel that started throwing a party and worshiping other gods when we deny that Jesus is coming. Are you living for Him today? Are you walking with Him in every part of your life today? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? If you do, how is your walk with Him right now? Have you grown impatient on waiting for God to provide His promises for you and you feel like giving up? Well, today's your day. Today's a day to step into a new glorious time or to step back into where you need to be. Father God, I just praise your name today. Lord, as we stand here in your very presence, as we stand at the base of your mountain, as we enter in, Lord, past the veil that you torn for us into your holy, holy place. Lord, I pray this morning... Lord, as you have touched our hearts, as you have given us instruction through your word today, Lord, that we would turn from those things, Lord, that has caused us to be impatient, or that's the result of us being impatient, that we would turn from the statement of, I can't wait, to a place where we love you, and we're chasing after you with all of our heart once again. Lord, burden our hearts this morning that nothing would draw us away from you. Thank you, Jesus.